<laughs> and wifey's gonna hang out to help me with the shared screen. So thank you for bearing with us. Are we live? Let's make sure. Okay, we're good. This is Hoya Locker Room, episode 70. Um, it's a, as I always say, this is a really important episode for us. Um, it's kind of serendipitous and full circle for me. Um, we have, have um, students, uh, current students of Georgetown. Uh, they produce a document, documentary called The Fabric of Georgetown Basketball. Um, and we're here to you know, we're going to show that we're going to show the documentary as well. But more importantly, we want to hear how this project came about, um, what inspired them, um, what brought them to this point where they wanted to embark upon something like this. Um, but before I do that, if if the students can introduce themselves, I, I, versus me butchering your name, if you can introduce yourself, I'd like that. Yeah, I can. We'll start handle. at the bottom, with Max. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Max. I'm a sophomore in the college at Georgetown University. I'm majoring in English with two minors in Justice and Peace Studies and Film and Media Studies, and I'm from Long Island, New York. Emma, okay. Dalen. I can go next. <laughs> uh, hi everyone. Thank you so much for having us on, first of all. My name is Dalen Waters. I'm a junior in the college majoring in American musical culture and double minoring in journalism as well as film and media studies. And I'll late add Emma. Yes. Um, hi, I'm Emma. I'm a junior in the college studying American studies. Um, and I'm from Chicago, and I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for cool, having me. Really cool. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to share my screen. We're going to debut the documentary, even though it's been out for, for a minute. Um, we'd like, for those who haven't seen it, we'd like to give you, get you as many views and likes as possible. Um, so bear with me a second as I try to do this. While he's doing that, I just, I have a question. I was on campus a couple of weeks ago. This has nothing to do with today's show, by the way. But I was on campus a couple of weeks ago and there was something going on because I'd never seen so many people on campus with Georgetown shirts on. Turns out there's this thing called Georgetown Day and I'm just so disappointed that Georgetown Day wasn't going on when I was there because it was 10 o'clock. I went up to Village A uh, taking pictures of my old apartment and at 10 a.m. in the morning I was offered a jello shot telling by someone telling me I could fit right in <laughs> how did you guys get that going what's the story behind that the last day of class and no one goes like tell us about that yes yeah, so the actual reason it started was because in uh, I think it's 2001, um, one of the players on the men's soccer team um, died after a fight with the hockey team. So it's almost like a memorial to him in a way that is also like celebratory for the rest of the school in like his memory. So it's, it, it has turned to be less of that, but that is the real reason it started. Wow. Yeah, it initially wow. started as an event for school spirit to be boosted. So it's kind of transformed into a means for students to celebrate Georgetown and to celebrate being a Hoya. Wow, that's a... kind of how like I, I'd like to be remembered when I go out party. Yeah, don't. Yeah, don't. I, anyone crying at my memorial? Walk, walk by and smack them out of it. But yeah, that, I, I didn't expect to hear that. Did you, Mark? I, 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 I did not. I did not at all. That's that was quite shocking. I thought somebody was just like, "Hey, let's have a party." That's uh. Quite honestly, like a lot of students don't even really know that that's like the original story behind it. I think it's just kind of become like a last Friday of classes. Right. Kind of, like Georgetown's one day to be kind of like a state school kind of day. <laughs> <laughs> Georgetown's one day to be a state school. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to use that somewhere in the script. <laughs> that was beautiful. Are we ready, Jane? 
Well, thank you for sharing that. With that, we're going to debut the student-produced documentary that we're also very proud of, The Fabric of Georgetown Basketball. I hear it, but I don't see it. Good now? Good now. Put yourself on mute, Jane. I am. Our search for a coach and our new basketball coach at Georgetown University will be Mr. John Thompson. I think that I'm definitely honored to be selected, you know, as a Georgetown coach. And I hope that together with the total college community that we can develop the type of basketball program here at Georgetown that is representative of the total community and is, and is equivalent to the rest of the uh, reputation of the institution. Coach Bruno, when he got the job, he wanted to be the first black coach to win the national championship, but he also felt that it was kind of crazy that it was a limited amount of co black coaches. I'm not interested in being the first or only black doing anything because it implies that in 1984, a black man finally became intelligent enough to win the NCAA title, and that's a very misleading thing. And I think he made an emphasis that he wanted to have all black players because there was a lot of talk about our intellect, we perform at this level where we capable of, of competing against other PWIs. It was an evolution over time, and he wanted to give us an opportunity. He was so good for, for Georgetown. He probably would have been good for whoever or wherever he was because he was a, a fair man. He wanted everybody treated fairly. He worked super, super hard to make sure that that happened for the young men that he recruited here. He wanted to make sure that they were given an opportunity to get an education and to play the sport that they love. I've seen and met Big John a few times um, when he was rolling through his own center, I guess. <laughs> I'm in the elevator, I'm getting ready for a game. I say, hey, like, hi, how are you? He goes, you gonna play well today? I'm a freshman at this time, so I'm like, I'm, I mean, if I get in, I'll try. He was like, no, 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 no. You didn't play too well last game. You gotta play well this game. It's true, I didn't play that well last game, so I was I was like, how did you even know that? I guess I just never assumed you might watch our games or just know who we are, because it's kind of just like, like he's Big John. This is the beginning of the season. I had just come off my uh, shoulder surgery, so I didn't really know where I was going to be fitting in or into the rotation. And he just told me one day, I'm not sure how the season's going to go, but I know that they're going to need you at one point, some point, so just stay ready, keep working. But after the transfers happened, the beginning of my senior year, we were playing Creighton. Terrell and Mac had like this really bad cold. Coach Pat had told me during the game that I might have to play the whole game. And this is the first game I played all 40 minutes. We ended up beating Creighton at home. And after every game we see big coach, he pulls me aside, shakes my hand. He said, didn't I tell you that they were going to need you? And it was just probably like five months apart. And it's crazy how like in his mind, he even, he re I remembered it, but I was surprised that he even remembered the conversation that we had. I got a chance to meet him in summer league in the Kenner League that he played in. I got a chance to uh, talk to him a little bit. There's one thing that he always said that he said I had, to, I had the ability to play for him just the way I played. That meant a lot to me. Just hearing that from him. Letting him coach like him. So his impact on the, on the basketball program and everything that he's done, you know, basketball and sports and college basketball, it's unbelievable, man. He's, he's a great man and a great coach. You know, there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of passion behind what the Thompsons represent, you know? So for me, it was something that I wanted to be a part of. Growing up in the DMV area, Georgetown basketball was a DMV. And it was really important to the city. We were, we were just America's team. Everybody's wearing blue and gray. And keep a tower on my shoulder like I used to close to Georgetown. Because if I wear my gear to class, then we'll know I play a sport. And, and then on top of that, I, I have the stereotypes of being black in that community, and that's just too much pressure. 
I've run into class one time with a full practice uniform because practice ran over. We had a test. I was about to be late. Get to the classroom. It's like you come in, people are automatically judging you. Culture shock. Um, I would spend like two, three hours of my day around, you know, all black people. When you're with a group of people, you have to act kind of a different way with a different group of people, especially being on the basketball team. You kind of feel like it's a spotlight on you, not even in like an arrogant sense, but more so just like people waiting on you to mess up or just act, you know, out of character. It's tough being a black person anywhere, but it's really tough being a black athlete at Georgetown. And there's a growing controversy in college athletics. Discrimination against college athletes, blacks in particular, is the charge being leveled at Proposition 42. That's a new policy of the NCAA. Because of what he did uh, in the early 70s, I think it, it gives us the platform and the responsibility to carry that forward. And I think our student athletes, even though that's a generations removed, so to speak, I think they feel that in their, in their essence. The type of athletes and the generation of athletes now are not just going to be focused on their sport. We're more than athletes. We have opinions, we have thoughts, and sports a lot of times is a microcosm for society as a whole. In 2020, after George Floyd was murdered, our Black Student Athletes came together to create the Black Student Athlete Coalition. I think with everything that happened, with plus being at home with the pandemic, it was definitely like our life was on pause anyways. And then suddenly, you know, we were faced with another tragedy in our community. And it was like, okay, like now is the time. Like we have their attention, they're listening to us. Now is the time to make sure that we use our voice and kind of create a space for the future. We've always been a place where, where social change and social justice and racial justice has been important to sort of the fabric and the DNA of the institution. I had gotten pulled, I, before the game, they had told me that, you know, it's Military Appreciation Day. And I just wanted them to know that what you are portraying is not what these people are going to see. To me, I didn't care. You know, the point is to make people upset. Like, the point is to bring attention. If we're not getting a response, then, you know, the point of protesting is to get people's attention. So, you know, when I told my team, they said, we don't care. We're going to kneel. We've been doing it all season. It would be weird if we didn't do it just for this specific day. So we did. We kneeled. You know, we stood up. It was quiet for maybe about two seconds as the color guard was leaving the, the court. And then all you heard from the stands was like, boo, Georgetown for kneeling. And then... Everyone around started booing, boo, and everyone started booing. And it, it was a bad situation afterwards. I never heard 10,000 people boo at one time. And it, it was, uh, it like, ran through your body. I, it, was, it was so uncomfortable, you know, <laughs> and I'm sure it kind of shook some of my teammates, too, just because that was just a hostile environment. Big John used to get spit on. I was like, I can take being booed, <laughs> you know, like a small step towards bringing attention to an issue that affects many black women on the team. We have every every single person on our roster takes a beat during the anthem, and we've done it every single game since the beginning of the year, and it has not, it has not changed. It just shows that Georgetown women's basketball is not the formula program. We're about what we say. Georgetown's a very personal program. Georgetown's a very personal university. It's very hands-on. Like it's, we're connected. I think the community piece was important in making those connections with my teammates and kind of growing into that and seeing like, okay, I, I have people here that I can trust and rely on. I can honestly say, I come back here and I want to see this team play next year. You know, even though I'm graduating, I, I want my freshmen to call me when they're seniors, you know, for like opportunities or whatever, if I can help them in any way like that. Like that's the type of relationship that this team has built this year. Which I committed to Georgetown because the history of Georgetown, the tradition, you know, the academic prominence. I looked at it as more of a 40 year decision rather than a four year decision. Working my way to Georgetown, kind of like they just came full circle when I got here. Starting from high school, I wasn't highly recruited at all. Jamie and Christian picked me up at Mount St. Mary's, then I ended up going to Siena and then Georgetown. That story alone is kind of like a story of my life. I mean, I always had to kind of 
worked for everything I, I had. It was, nothing, it was no handout. So I kind of got used to that process. I didn't really want anything handed out to me. Um, if I didn't work for it, it just didn't feel right. I just thought about where I came from and like what it took to get to this point and to be prepared for this opportunity. And it just all made sense based on how I was raised and based on how I had to get everything in this basketball. A lot of people on my team are like very, you know, kind hearted and I think as some people they look at us as just as just athletes. But like we go through the daily struggles of being a student at Georgetown as well. Like we struggle through finals, we struggle through midterms, we have to eat at Leo's, stuff like that. So I think it's just trying to view us as just regular people, not just, you know, athletes. Okay, I'm back. Are you back? Back. Okay. I don't have a screen. My bad. You're good. Okay. Um, powerful, powerful stuff. Um, I had mentioned to Markham before we came on. <laughs> That was my, uh, I had wanted to wait until we got on um, to watch it again. That's my second time watching it. Um, um, because I kind of wanted to save the, the emotions and the feelings for, for, for this episode. Um, before, before we dive in, um, just an incredible amount of thanks uh, to the students and the professors and everybody for, for pulling this off. Um, again, very powerful. Um, for me, um, and before I turn it over to Mark, I just want to give a shout out to um, the first African American player at Georgetown, um, Bernard White, um, 1966 through 69, who's at Georgetown. So, just want to give him a shout out. If you want to read up on him, um, Georgetown history, Georgetown Hoyer Project, uh, just Google it. Um, you can check him out. But I definitely want to give him. I think it's appropriate with this, with this episode to. We've mentioned them before in the program. Um, so with that, I'd like to dive in, talk to the students. I'll turn over to Mark real quick. Uh, well, first, let me tell you guys, congratulations. That was, that was awesome. Uh, and I am curious to know, uh, what was the inspiration for the project, really? All of you guys are on mute, by the way. Just, just take your mutes off. Like, I don't... I get the feeling you guys are operating like you operate in, in, in Georgetown Zoom classes. Take that mute in the class. <laughs> and, and jump in whenever you want to jump in. <laughs> Perfect. I can kind of start off. But um, at the beginning of the semester, our class was social justice documentary. So we had to pitch quite a few ideas to our professor. But this idea seems to be the most sustainable just in terms of the people we were able to speak with. They were willing and able to meet with us. And the other ideas we had were just, they heavily relied on external sources. So this seemed to be the most uh, viable. And uh, we knew we wanted to do a story about black leadership here at Georgetown. The initial focus was gonna be about coaching, but after speaking with a lot of the student athletes, we kind of shifted our focus from coaching to just the black student athlete perspective. And we were able to see and analyze Coach Thompson's legacy through their lens and see how his legacy is alive and well today, and the kind of imprint that he left on a lot of the student athletes here today. Yeah. And I think um, 
Coach Thompson was always kind of at the core of, of kind of the questions we had and like the different stories that we were trying to tell. And I think it was throughout the process kind of a question of like how much of him we should or needed to have. Because on one hand, like obviously that's an incredible story that has not been told to the extent that it should be, but we also only had 10 to 12 minutes for our documentary. So I think it was always a question of how much of his story we could and should tackle. Um, but even from the beginning, like when we had the coach idea, really the idea behind that was that he was kind of paved the way for these black coaches to, you know, leave their impact on Georgetown, on college basketball at large, on college athletics in general. Um, and that kind of, you know, even if we shifted away from the coach idea, he still kind of was at the core of, okay, he's paved the way for these black student athletes to, you know, play the sport they love, be students kind of make their own impacts. And that was, um, even if it changed kind of a lot over the course of it, it, it was always kind of in the end with him him in mind, I think. That, that, that to me was the thing that, and I think I mentioned this at the initial showing, that to me was the most telling, the fact that you were able to do this in 10 to 12, in 12 minutes yeah. and still leave me with, um, not necessarily wanting more, but you, you, you define, you know what I mean? You, de you define something like it, it made an imprint. Um, I read, I read a couple of comments and some people were like, you know, I had lumps in my throat. I was spellbounded. Um, and, and this story has been told, you know, before, but again, I, I think the way um, your team was able to, to show the story was, or tell this story was, was, was very powerful. It's very powerful. Um, so yeah, I, again, I want, we want to congratulate you on that. Um, what What were some of your uh, major challenges in doing it? I, um, I could actually start. Some of the major challenges in the beginning were mostly about getting interviews. Actually, like uh, Gene was one of our first, but um, getting a hold of him in the beginning was it was a little like um, t a phone tag in the beginning. Um, and then once we got a hold of him, he was very helpful with the rest of it. But um, some of our other interviews, like just based on like their position or especially if they were current players, they were in the season. So um, they had some like either not necessarily legal issues, but where like they weren't able to speak to us right away until a certain date after they were done playing or even past players. Like some of them were in other countries. So it was just coordinating that among our team and getting like us, our availability to coordinate with theirs was a little tough. But once that was all done, like it worked out really well. Again, something that you just mentioned that jumped out at me is that so you had Terrell Allen, who's only, only played at Georgetown for a year. Um, and then Donald Carey, you know, uh, two years. Um, but they still, you know, felt, felt the connection or they still, you know, knew the story. They still had, um, you know, a conversation or a meeting with Ms. Coach Thompson. The same thing with, with Ms. Wright. You know the the fact that he made that 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 comment to her about playing well. I guess what I'd like to to ask you guys is, what did you know about Georgetown uh, basketball? Uh, what did you know about Coach Thompson? Uh, is it something that your parents maybe shared with you? Um, so <laughs> initially, you know, what was your first contact with Georgetown basketball? Yeah, I can say for me, I realized I didn't mention earlier that I'm from Bowie, Maryland. So I grew up in the DMV from PG County. So uh, my grandmother and my dad's side actually went to Georgetown Law, but I was first introduced to Georgetown basketball because both of my parents were DC natives and they were there to witness firsthand the basketball powerhouse in the 80s and the early 90s. So I've always heard a lot of stories about Georgetown basketball and from a young age, I would attend the men's basketball game. So that was my first introduction to the school. And after I learned about the program and its history in the school, Georgetown just became my dream school. And I was very familiar with uh, Coach Thompson's legacy. And from that young age, I was already immersed in the historical, cultural, and social impact of Georgetown basketball. And that kind of, that's kind of stuck with me up till today, just working with being at Georgetown, working with the athletics department and now working with the Wizards where JT3 is there and still kind of being immersed in that culture back when I used to play and 
ironically, Coach Crouch uh, coached me during one of the Wizards and Mystics camps when I was in like elementary school. So it's like a whole full circle moment for me. Nice. Uh, I think it was uh, Savannah, or maybe it was, uh, sorry, I, I can't remember who said it, that it was uh, difficult being a, a black athlete at Georgetown. Uh, and that kind of disappointed me uh, because you had the clip uh, about Prop 42 uh, when Coach Thompson walked off. And I either, I was either there uh, as a manager or I read about it in the history books. I'm not gonna tell you which one, <laughs> um, but uh, I would hope that that same kind of thing wouldn't be going going on because my first day of of class were registering before before class started never will forget I was standing in line and behind me was a white guy uh, from Memphis where I'm from with his parents I'm with my parents and Memphis is the only city in the south where basketball is bigger than football and I went to Georgetown right after uh, what I would call the peak. And if I was good enough to have been recruited uh, to play basketball for Georgetown at that time, everybody in the city would have known me uh, by my face. And the guy's dad says to me as we're standing in line, oh, so you must be here to play a little ball. And I must have looked at him like I was ready to slit his throat because before I could say a word, his wife says to him, you tell him you're here for the same reason our son is, and that's to get your lesson. Uh, but the, that kind of, I mean, what she said was just, it, it was troubling for me. Like, do, do you guys, uh, first of all, did any of you guys play sports? Or is this just, so you didn't. So I'm, I'm assuming though that you probably know uh, some athletes at school. Like, is that like kind of a, uh, a common thread in that community? Like that it's uh, a little heavier weight to carry? I will say from some of my um, friendships with people on the basketball team and um, other teams at Georgetown. Hearing that like initially was like jolting, but like you said, for someone who's been a part of the program, it, it seems like that kind of pride that was there in the eighties and nineties has kind of transformed into pressure, which was the theme of that, um, the theme of that section, that quarter. But I have heard from a few people like Shania and Sari that there is a, additional sense of pressure and like burden that comes with being black student athletes, especially on a team that has this high historical and legacy built into it. Like it's woven in the fabric of it. So I have heard that from a few people. I cannot speak for them, but just from the interviews that we've done, like that, I mean, the story tells itself, you can see how it has different impacts on people who are representing Georgetown across their chest. I'd like to hear from Max and Emma on that point as well, because yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm burning to jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think with, it, it really kind of did depend on who we were talking to, to be honest. Um, but I think there was always kind of, especially like what Jagan said, like there always is kind of feeling that people are always waiting on you to mess up because you're in such um, a spotlight and people are like literally watching you maybe on tv you're, they're watching you kind of walk across campus you're pretty identifiable in that way and i think we we had a lot of footage and this is a kind of a debate we had um across the semester with kind of how to balance you know these struggles that these student athletes are going through but then also not kind of just sitting with that and not also celebrating the ways that um they're kind of able to, to work with those struggles and kind of make something of them. Not that they should have to, but like, I think 
um, our focus really did want to be like on the ways that they were able to kind of persevere. But we did have a lot of stuff kind of that we left on the cutting room floor that was kind of about specifically stereotypes that they faced in the classroom and how that, um, you know, I think who, I think Shania had, had a comment where a professor like left her a comment and said like, she was surprised that Shania wrote as well as she did. Um, so there's, we had a lot of stuff like that and they, the they had a lot of stories like that, which are obviously heartbreaking and horrible um, considering just kind of, A, the fact that they're representing Georgetown to the country and to the nation. Um, but then also they have to deal with, you know, these insane schedules <laughs> just as student athletes and all the things that they have on their plates as people who are athletes. Um, yeah, it's, it's really upsetting and it was really disappointing. And I think, yeah, that was kind of a challenge just, just in the process of editing the, the film and how much to kind of sit with that and how much kind of to not let, you know, the kind of characters we created kind of be defined by that. Um, yeah. Waiting on you, Max. Oh, I wasn't sure if you wanted me else to go. Um, but yeah, I, I think answering like the original question, like I really didn't have much familiarity with um, any of the players on the team. I'm just not a huge sports fan or player just in general. Um, but it was really interesting being able to be a part of this and get to meet all of them, talk to them. And I'm kind of adding on to what Emma was saying about like the anecdotal things, some of which weren't even included in it, just based on like how much time we had to, um, you know, how much time we had to include in the documentary. I remember, Gene, you saying about your friend, I can't remember who it was, who like during course registration, um, you were like, be, um, you and him had like different ways of going about it. Like you talked to the advisor and so well, it worked well, but he just like had a vision and really wanted to do certain classes and just like went ahead with it and ended up even dropping off the team. So I think it just like shows like how um, like diverse, like the, just the player right is, especially like academically um, and like how um, you're not, you're not just like players, you know, there's a lot more to it and you're all students just like everyone else. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, Dayla gave us a little bit of her background uh, in terms of where she's from. Uh, Emma and Max, uh, where are you from? And did did and, and Dayla kind of said that, that the program and uh, history and her family kind of made her a dream school. I'm, I'm guessing the program didn't have much of an influence for you, Max, but uh, but based on you saying you're not being as much of a sports fan, um, uh, Emma, like, did, yeah. did the program have any influence on your decision to matriculate? So um, I'm from Chicago, so I'm not from the area, but I did have an uncle who went to Georgetown and he is a massive Georgetown basketball fan. So I think when he was kind of pitching Georgetown to me, that was always a really big part of it. I am not naturally like a big sports fan, I think. And I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this. I had actually not gone to my first game until the end of the season this year, <laughs> which I can blame COVID in part. And like my parents are always like, how have you not been to the game yet? And I'm like, no. Well, if you're going to you gonna pick a year to miss a game, this would be one. <laughs> <laughs> so Dalen, Dalen was there for my first game and it was nice. Um, I, I don't think they won, but that's, that's okay. Um, but yeah, and I think it's, for me, it was really a process of like trying to, it was kind of a crash course in Georgetown basketball, honestly, because the semester is really not that long. It's it's 16-ish weeks. We had basically 12 weeks to make our documentary. Um, so that meant, you know, reading the autobiography, that meant like digging into, you know, Hoya Hoop Club, digging into all these things that I really had no initial familiarity with, but I think I very quickly had to become very familiar with a lot of history and not a lot of time. Um, and now like I have like so much appreciation for it in a way that it's just like a whole, it's a world to me that like people were pushing me to kind of get into and I kind of resisted for a while, but like, yeah, I'm, I'm fully on board now. Um, and I, I regret not going to a game my freshman year because that was pretty, that was pretty silly in retrospect, but. <laughs> So I'm, I'm curious from, from for all three of you, what was the 
the best thing about doing this project and what was the worst thing? Um, I guess I could start with you think. Um, I think the best thing was definitely um, like getting to meet all of the players and also all of the other staff we had interviewed and also Gene, like previous players too. Um, especially getting to go into spaces that like we're typically not like permitted access to because it's just like more restrictive, um, you know, only players only or certain areas like that. And I think the hardest part or like worst part, um, if you want to call it that, was like just kind of like going back and forth on like the editing in general, just because it's like so tedious work that Daylin was doing really. And like, you know, it's hard to be like, um, even just as a professor and the TA, like, so like, critical of like something that was so good even in the beginning, but like little like nitpicky things here and there. And just like having to kind of like go back and sometimes even like go back to like the drawing board and like start certain things over was like a little bit tough, but I think that's just what comes along with filmmaking in general. Yeah, just to follow up on that, the most challenging thing for me being one of the editors was trying to figure out how to tell the story. But once we figured out the story we wanted to tell, it, it kind of just told itself, but with the plethora of information, archival footage, our own shot footage, and just looking through everything that we got for this project, it was a matter of framing it in a way where we wanted to make sure all the threads were kind of woven together in a, a nice, unique packaged way where the story would tell itself and the narrative would kind of just flow along. So that for me would, would have been the most challenging part of this process. And I'd say the best part for me was just being able to hear all of these different stories, you know, being a black student at Georgetown, I could kind of just share some of the experiences, but of course my experience is gonna be completely different from a black student athlete and everyone has their own unique experience. So for me, hearing what it's like for the people we spoke with, just representing Georgetown on regional, national, and now global scales, uh, that was just profound for me. And I really appreciate everyone we were able to speak with and their willingness to share their stories and for trusting in us to be able to do them justice. Yeah, I mean, just to echo what they both have already said, I think the best part was gathering yeah. all of all the material and that, you know, was all the interviews that we had to do and like talking to people and hearing about their experiences and hearing the passion that they have for their experiences, whether, you know, they're there in their senior year and they've been at Georgetown for a few years, or if this was like 20 years in the past, like people still have that exact same passion for like the work that they did and their time on the court. Um, as well as like, I got to do a lot of fun archival research. So I got to go find some old pictures, kind of just literally put my gloves on, get, get into the files and find some, um, some cool old gems. But I think the hardest part was finding ways to whittle all that down into kind of a cohesive story. Um, because 10 to 12 minutes is just not a lot of time at all. And we had probably somewhere, I, I want to say somewhere from like eight to 10 hours of footage, just total. I don't know how you did it. I don't know how you did it. I don't really know how we did either in <laughs> retrospect. <laughs> My interview alone was 24 hours. So I don't know how you did it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we just had, we had so much good stuff and we had so many angles we could have gone on and any of them, I think, would have made good documentaries. They would have made good stories. Um, so it well, really well, I will good. say that I noticed you, you, you got a picture of Gene in there uh, at the White House and you didn't get a picture of me pouring Gatorade or watching anybody's <laughs> jock strap. So I'm a little disappointed, but you know, I give you an A anyway. What, 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 what I do, and, and guys, we're, we're like right around 50 minutes and I wanna let you guys go because you're students. I don't know, I, I don't know if you guys are still doing finals or you're done or what's the no, deal Class is, but, is over. Class is over? Okay. Well, you got Paulina to do whatever you want to do. We're just extremely appreciative of your time, um, but what I did want to share with you is, you know, again, how much this is full circle for me um, and having you guys embark upon this. Um, because I'm sure when Coach Thompson started this thing, um, I don't know if he would ever have envisioned this. He might have envisioned his players uh, like Mark, 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 Mark and I doing something on this level, but to have students who weren't even born, you know, alone thought of kind of get that gravitational pull in terms of what Georgetown is all about. 
is is pretty powerful to me. And I and and, and I probably shared it with you with the all the hours that we talked, um, which seemed like a lot to me anyway. Um, um, like I didn't know the power and the magnitude of the program until many years later after I had graduated, um, because Coach was unique in his approach in that he never, and Mark and Mark will speak to this as well, because again, his experiences is, are his experiences, but it wasn't like coach made you feel like you were doing something special. You know, it was more about, um, um, this is what you chose to do. And we're doing it this way and at a high and at the highest level. Um, to say that he was a marked man back then, maybe, over dramatizing it, but by the same token, um, he ran a very tight ship for a reason. Um, and and to to see this come again full circle to where where they celebrate it now, I think is a really cool deal. Um, and again, I, I think I mentioned this at the at the screening. I'd love to see an encore. Um, I think the social justice thing you just kind of skimmed it, but again, you only had twelve minutes. Um, but you still, I, th I think you still spoke about it in a way that was unique. And, and, and Mark, I'll let you dive in there. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious what grade you got on this. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. <laughs> we, don't know. Yeah. we don't know. But seeing the impact that it's had on everyone who's watched it, I mean, that's rewarding. And it's yeah, so you know, you're worried about the grade. Well, <laughs> well we, have, we have a special guest that we wanted to, to have jump in here. Um, and uh, she wanted to have some things to say as well. Um, I, had to, I had to prod her. She didn't really want to come on because again, this is all about you guys. Um, but Mary Beth Corrigan, um, I hey, think Anna, you're, you're, teed, you're teed up, you're teed up. And Max, I remember meeting Max and Dalen during the, our initial like Zoom call, but Emma, Emma came into the library several times. And, and I just want to echo what you know, Jean and Markham have been saying, I mean, I think your selection of examples and quotes was amazing. And I was really struck in listening to it, you know, in this episode where you use John Thompson's quote saying that he wanted to represent the whole community. And to me, that, I mean, we're still looking for re re representation, but right now the demands have changed towards inclusion and I, I think we're, you know, what you're kind of trying to capture with the black student athletes is our questions around that. And I, I just think you did really an amazing job with all of the material you had. And it is hard to go through and figure out what it is you want to use. And you really picked out great, great examples from his career. I mean, you could have gone on forever. You know, there's the choice of bringing Iverson in. This is the way he handled Patrick Ewing. There's, you know, um, I mean, and you started by looking at the early years too, and you really could have done a whole thing on that. So I, I think, I think it was, you just did a really incredible job. And, um, you know, and I, I hope that this is a transformative experience for you too, so that you can begin to pursue your interests. I mean, especially the question of mental health and athletes seems to have come up and been in the forefront for you, not to mention, you know, and obviously, you know, the, the, the broader questions of the position of black student at black students period is at Georgetown is a big one. So I just want to thank you so much for, for everything you've done. It gives me hope. You know, well, thank you for all of your help. I mean, it truly was so immensely, immensely helpful <laughs> just for us. Well, Lynn is the one who brought you the material, so <laughs> you know, so I'm here for both of us, but I really appreciate this. I'm mean, Lynn's not really a basketball fan, she's 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 British. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jane mentioned uh, an encore. I'm curious. Uh, I mean, I know this was a class assignment, but were any of you, and, and also let, let me just back up a little bit. Uh, I'm an actor and a writer, so I was very disappointed uh, in Gene stopping the credits. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he stopped that and jumped in. So we didn't, uh, we heard Daylin say that she was an editor. Uh, Max and Emma, uh, what were your credits? 
and just know that had I been running uh, the shared screen, the credits would have run. <laughs> my, my apologies, my apologies. It's okay. Um, wait, Dalen, do you want to finish um, saying the rest of your credits? She has way more than that. Uh, okay. <laughs> You're giving me a lot of credit, but thank you. Um, I was director of photography, producer, uh, editor, and sound designer. Wow. And I um, co-edited and was co-director of photography with Dalen. Um, then I was co-researcher writer uh, with Anna, who couldn't make it today. And I was responsible for 20 hours of footage. <laughs> 20 hours you know, of the, the, the first time I looked at it, I thought, oh, they didn't listen to me and Lynn talk about fair use. So I went through it again. And then I saw all the credits of all the materials you used. So you did get what we were saying about fair yeah. use. It was it you really did include uh, credits for all the images that you use. So um, and, you know, to be honest, most students don't do that. So we appreciate that. <laughs> So my, my question would be like, even though it was a class assignment, were you uh, bitten by the bug, so to speak, and have any desire to continue doing this kind of thing? And whether it's in a class, or, first of all, the, the, uh, the majors you guys are saying, none of that stuff was there when I was there. I'm, I'm kind of jealous. Uh, I, I would love to be uh, doing some of the things you guys are doing, uh, but any desire to, to do a follow-up? I think that would be a no. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for someone else to jump in. But I like I've, I've been fortunate to work on some projects with the Black Student Athlete Coalition, BSAC, before this project that we were able to use for the documentary. So uh, just being exposed to a lot of the social justice initiatives and the things that have kind of already been occurring during my four years at Georgetown and working on this project. I mean, I love being able to tell stories that are larger than myself. So if I had the opportunity to do it again, I would not say no. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm glad Martin brought that up. Um, and Mary Beth on cue almost uh, mentioned Alan Iverson. And um, I, I don't think it uh, should be lost on anyone uh, that he wound up going to Georgetown. Um, and, I, and I think the significance of that is lost um, because of, in my opinion, um, the person that Alan obviously is. Um, he's not interested in uh, doing anything commercial. He's not interested in, this almost goes back to Charles Barkley saying uh, at a Nike commercial. I'm not a role model. I'm not a role model. And, Alan Iverson to me represents uh, social justice. Alan Iverson to me uh, represents independence. Alan Iverson to me represents Georgetown. And I think, and, 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 and a telltale sign to me is when players today in 2022 um, get an offer from Georgetown, they use the photo of Alan Iverson. They still do, yeah. They don't use the photo of Markham Stansberg. Um, <laughs> Or Gene Smith, for that matter. Just saying. I'll, I'll, and I only say that to um, just to put a, a bug in your ear, tap you on the shoulder. If you're going down for that encore, I think he would be incredibly powerful. Um, you know, it's to me, to me, the Iverson story, and to you, and to, to a large extent too. But the Iverson story, it was really a courageous decision to bring him to Georgetown um, because. I can say knowing what the predominantly white community thought is that they didn't necessarily think that he was innocent of what he was charged with. And, and, you know, it was, it was seen as bringing in this really great player. And of course people bought into it, that, that kind of achievement is what they wanted. But the reality is, is that coach saw that it was a sham charge and that he, you know, and, and that he needed to step in. And, and I think it was a really courageous decision and um, it can't be lost that he did it. And it can't be lost to the fact that the university administration gave him the room to do that. Well, um, well I, I would say this, Mary Beth. Uh, uh, while what you say is true, uh, and I think Big John would say this also. 
uh, he would not have displayed that same courage if Allen Iverson was a trumpet player. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, there's no question about that <laughs> no he wouldn't have done that first for the for one of the managers <laughs> yeah you're right so um again thank everyone so much uh in particular thank the students thank the professor professor that provided you the opportunity to show your skills um and again i i, I hope you guys stay in touch um, with the with the program with the university continue to shed light um, on something that I think is a conversation that can continue to evolve. Um, I can't thank you guys enough. Um, I usually leave it up to my esteemed co-host to say some parting words. If he doesn't have any, I'd be surprised. Um, but again, I can't I can't thank you guys enough. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanders. Uh -huh. But, but, but I, a couple of weeks ago, when we had Mike Riley on, there was a conversation that came up about the quotes we used to trade. Uh, so uh, I've been looking up and finding quotes uh, to kind of share with people. And the quote I'm gonna share is uh, actually, a pair, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this particular quote because of the age of, of, of the majority of the people, I guess it's even, uh, but we have so many students on. Uh, it's a really a paraphrase of a quote from Frederick Douglass. Uh, maybe we'll get into some Frederick Douglass stuff on another uh, episode because uh, it's very important stuff regarding Frederick Douglass happened with me at Georgetown. Uh, but this quote is from Beyonce. Uh, Power is not given to you. That's in with that. And thank you guys very much uh, for taking time out on your Sunday. Uh, we appreciate it. And uh, look forward to having you back on uh, for part two. Did everyone hear his quote? Did everyone you didn't hear? hear? Didn't hear? I, didn't, I said, I didn't hear. power is not given to you. You have to take it. Beyonce knows. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Boya Saxa. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Boya Saxa. Deuces. <laughs> <laughs>